today we'll be featuring Dr. Dennis Wilson, and he will be discussing Wilson's temperature syndrome. I'm Jen Palmer. I'm a naturopathic doctor and the education and communication director for AARM. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I know it's hard to take time out of your busy schedule. I just want to give you a few quick housekeeping notes. Uh, Dr. Wilson is going to speak for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A at the end. Feel free to type in your questions anytime during the presentation in that box on your right hand side of your screen, and we will take them at the end of the session. And we are recording this webinar today, so if you know somebody who's interested and wasn't able to attend, uh, just let them know they can go to the YouTube page and type in restorative medicine, and our page will pop up, and we will have this loaded up uh, by the end of today, the recording. Uh, Dr. Wilson specializes in optimizing peripheral thyroid function and through his Wilson's Temperature Syndrome Protocol. He's worked with over 5,000 patients, and he was the first doctor to use sustained release lyothyronine. His novel protocol is now a standard of care with a subsection of physicians practicing integrative medicine, and his work is taught in naturopathic medical schools. I know I learned about it at Bastyr University many years ago. Uh, Dr. Wilson is the author of three books, including the extensively referenced evidence-based approach to restoring thyroid health. So without further ado, thank you, Dr. Wilson, for being here, and I will just let you take it away. Thank you, Jen. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet with you all here today, and it's, I'm all constantly amazed by modern technology that allows us to do something like this. It's just a fantastic time to be alive. I'll never even cease to be amazed by a cell phone. But our, our um, luckily today's um, discussion is going to be a lot simpler than uh, cell, cell phones and internet technology, I think. Um, or maybe it's as simple as a one and a zero, I'm not sure. But this, I'm just going to be asking you to, or persuade you, or suggest to you, encourage you to just accept one simple concept. And this, if you can accept this one simple concept and, and add it to, to your thinking, if you don't have it already, then that will help you easily solve mysteries that you can't, uh, you couldn't solve otherwise. And there's a lot of physicians that aren't familiar with this concept, or if they are, they don't accept it. And that prevents them from making sense of their thyroid patients and their metabolism patients. And I'm sure you can relate to, as I can, um, how confusing thyroid health can be and thyroid metabolism and thyroid problems can be sometimes <clears throat> when you're trying to um, sort out why someone's not feeling that well. And uh, it's just impossible to, to sort that out without this concept. But with this concept, it's really not that hard. Uh, and in fact, it's very easy. So um, I'm, going, I'm going to be available for complimentary consultations by phone or email um, to guide you to great results with your patients. This is what I do. This is my passion. I want to help as many doctors, help as many patients as possible. And it's a fun thing to do. And I really enjoy the results that doctors get with their patients. And when you of course, when you get great results with your patients, it builds your practice uh, through word of mouth, and that's, that's something I enjoy doing too, is helping doctors uh, succeed, especially in this day and age. So the simple concept we're talking about is um, the thyroid hormone expression, and I'm going to equate that to body temperature. Depends on thyroid hormone transport. It depends on the uptake and conversion as well as thyroid hormone production in, in the thyroid gland, and that's it. So we can end this webinar almost. That's that's the one simple concept that it's not just about the TSH. It's not just about the thyroid blood tests, as if the thyroid gland hormone production was the only factor in the expression. And remember, <clears throat> the whole purpose of thyroid hormone is to go to the T3, I mean, is to go to the um, nucleus of the cell and to tell the body how fast to transcribe DNA. And uh, we'll get to that in a second. That DNA 
transcription determines how fast people live and that determines the body temperature. So the first, the first step you take when you come, what I always recommend is when you have a patient coming in and maybe they think they have a thyroid problem or maybe uh, you're wondering if they have a slow metabolism, it's a very simple thing to figure out. You just look at their temperature. If they have a low temperature, then there's a, there's a, that's an indication that they have a slow metabolism. Notice that I didn't say look at their TSH. I said look at their temperature <clears throat> because, remember, the end result of the thyroid expression is the temperature. So first we look at the temperature. Then if the temperature is low, that's when we look at the TSH. Because if the temperature is low and the TSH is high, then the person has something we call hypothyroidism, which is a deficiency in the production of thyroid hormone from the thyroid gland itself. And that's getting more common, but it only affects 3% of the population. Um, it's not that common, but it does happen, and, and Hashimoto's is getting more prevalent all the time. Even 50% of our population now has um, antibodies for TP, the thyroid peroxidase, um, enzyme, and so we do have toxins in our environment that is getting more common, but much more common than that is if a person's temperature is low and their TSH is normal, then they could have something I call Wilson's temperature syndrome, which is still symptomatic. It still causes symptoms that are reversible, and that's due to peripheral um, difficulties in the thyroid pathways, um, probably impaired T4 to T3 conversion in the peripheral tissues. Something in the peripheral tissues is amiss when the person's temperature is low, their TSH is normal. So patients have low thyroid. So the, the problem that we have that we all see is that patients have low thyroid symptoms, but their thyroid blood tests and other tests are normal. And see, that is what's baffling again to, to other doctors because if you're thinking that the only explanation for um, the thyroid hormone expression is thyroid hormone production, then, then you can't make sense of that. But patient, and there's patients that are on thyroid medicine and their thyroid tests are normal, but they still aren't feeling well. Again, you, the temperature, I mean, the, the blood test will never be a good expression, a good evaluation of the metabolic rate because blood tests don't measure body temperature. And again, temperature is the direct reflection and the direct measurement of thyroid hormone expression. And even though other things can cause, uh, it can influence the temperature, like a fever, um, like progesterone, like other things, still the baseline temperature you know, regulation, the, the baseline what your temperature regulation is, is uh, that's the responsibility of the thyroid system, what you are at baseline. And, <clears throat> and if on average your temperature is low, that's more than enough to explain all kinds of symptoms that we'll discuss in a minute. So the solution, again, is you look at the temperature and the TSH. So I'm only asking you to, you know, uh, use the concept that we're going to look at temperature and TSH, not just TSH. And with that combination, we can have, uh, it's very simple and we can have lots of success with our patients. So we talked about this, about the how T3 goes into the cell, into the membrane um, of the cytoplasm and then into passes the nuclear membrane into the nucleus. And that's where it just, um, that's where some things happen there in order to uh, increase the speed of DNA transcription. And of course, the DNA is the code of life, and that's what thyroid does. It tells us how fast to live. And the faster we live, the warmer we get. And the slower we live, the slower we get. Everybody knows that low body temperature is a classic symptom of myxedema coma. Temperature, high temperature goes with hyperthyroidism. So there is a correlation between temperature and thyroid function. <clears throat> and when you have 
a low temperature, that's plenty to explain uh, low thyroid symptoms. So going back to high school physics, the kinetic energy in a system is proportional to the temperature. In other words, how fast uh, something is traveling or how much speed it has is measured by the temperature. So when we measure temperature, we're actually measuring velocity. So you can see from this molecule that the higher the temperature, the higher the amplitude of the movement. So when you have a thermometer outside and you're measuring the temperature outside, you're actually measuring the speed of the air molecules. The faster, the higher the temperature, that means that the air molecules are traveling faster. And that's the same way it is in our human body. The, the faster our molecules are moving, the higher our body temperature is and that's regulated by the thyroid system. So it's important to remember that three of the four vital signs have to do with speed. So we have respiratory rate, heart rate, and metabolic rate, or in other words, temperature. And then we have blood pressure. So is velocity important? Yes, velocity is important, speed's important. How fast we operate is very important. And that's what's regulated by the thyroid system. And this is this big orange box here in the center is this simple concept that we're adding. You can imagine if that, that orange box wasn't there, and then we would just have we would just have supply on top of expression and that would be it. And that was the uh, concept that most of us uh, physicians were trained with, that that the blood tests are a direct reflection of thyroid hormone expression. And um, that doesn't uh, work. It's the uh, they don't correlate. The blood tests don't correlate uh, reliably with how a person feels because of this big orange box here. So they the thyroid hormone blood tests don't measure body temperature, and body temperature is thyroid hormone expression. So we measure the temperature, and then we look at the blood test. And if again, if we have this. If we have normal blood tests, but we have low expression, we have low temperature and we have normal thyroid blood tests, that's when we can start suspecting a problem in the conversion. And that's something, remember I said that hypothyroidism happens in 3% of the population and that's considered somewhat of a, an epidemic? Well, a problem in thyroid hormone conversion, the people that have low temperatures and still have, they have low temperatures and they still have normal thyroid blood tests, it accounts for about 30% of the population or 40%. Or so it's about, 10, it's about 10 times more people have a problem with that than they do with um, hypothyroidism. So the first thing we consider is this supply. And again, a person comes in, and is their temperature low? Is it high? Do they have symptoms of hypothyroidism? If, they're, if they have symptoms and their temperature is low, then we look at the supply. And, and we, we evaluate the supply. We consider the supply. And you might have a person that's on thyroid hormone medicine. They might be on T4-containing medicine. But the first thing you want to ask them is, what was your TSH? If they're not on thyroid medicine, you ask them, what's your TSH now? Let's get your TSH now to see if it's normal. But if they are on thyroid medicine, you could ask what their TSH is now, and that would be, that would be relevant. But a really good question, too, that I always encourage doctors to, to ask, which um, many times they'll forget to ask this, but what was the TSH before the patient was put on T4-containing medicine, like Armour Thyroid or Synthroid? Because many, you know, if the person's temperature, if the person's TSH was normal before they were put on Synthroid or uh, on the upper limits of normal, then they never were hypothyroid, more than likely. And some doctors would say, well, we want to treat it if the TSH is, is higher than 1 or higher than 2 or higher than 3. But as long as the TSH is less than 4, I'm, that, that's, uh, 
probably more of a conversion problem than a supply problem. It might be headed toward a supply problem, but it's still uh, it's still within normal range. So so you want to know um, if they if they had a problem with their thyroid hormone production or not. So if uh, once you evaluate that, I mean, if they have a thyroid hormone supply problem, you can you can treat it as such. But if they don't, then then you might have a, a, a thyroid hormone conversion problem. You can treat that as such. The big difference there is that sometimes thyroid hormone, or maybe even frequently, thyroid hormone supply problems are permanent. Like a thyroidectomy is permanent. You're going to have to take thyroid medicine the rest of your life. But a thyroid hormone conversion problem is not permanent. It's reversible, almost always reversible, completely reversible, to the point that a person can get back to normal and not have to take thyroid medicine for their life, and they can wean off the medicine. Their temperature and symptoms can re remain normal even after the treatment has been discontinued, and that's a, a huge difference there. So one thing to know is that you really want to, take somebody off this T4 containing medicine if they don't need T4 containing medicine because T4 and reverse T3 can downregulate the deiodinase enzyme which is which is responsible for the conversion of T4 to T3 so we sometimes treat somebody like a supply problem and actually they have a conversion problem and by doing so by treating them in the wrong way by giving them T4 that actually can make their conversion problem worse. And so that's why lots of people who are taking T4 continued medicine can be weaned off the treatment and uh, with proper herbal and nutritional support or temporary therapy, they can, they can get off the T4 contained medicine. And that's why, why a lot of people who are on T4 contained medicine still don't feel well. And that just is baffling to doctors, as you know, the, the patient the patient had a thyroidectomy, now the patient is on T4 containing medicine, now the TSH is normal, now the patient feels as bad as ever, if not worse. And it's just, it's just a, myster uh, it's a mystery because you've fixed the supply and they still feel terrible. Well, surgeries and different things like that can further impair conversion or, or initiate conversion because of the stress involved. So, you know, if we ignore the conversion aspect, then then we're not going to be able to solve these mysteries. But if you include the conversion aspect, it's a real simple, it's a real simple solution. So if that TSH is normal and the temperature is low, then it's probably a conversion problem. And we want the patient to produce a normal temperature. And if the person isn't getting a normal temperature, then they're not optimal. They're not being optimized. They're not. We have no reason to hope that they're going to feel any uh, feel well. We have no reason to expect a person's going to feel well if their temperature is not normal. So we want to encourage conversion, and we do that by providing herbal and nutritional support. We can decrease the T4 and reverse T3 by weaning T4 medicine or by using T3, and we can decrease a person's stress. We can. Uh, help them detoxify with, with uh, uh, sweating and exercise and uh, proper diet uh, to clean up their system so that they can feel better. So the parameter that with a proper supply and with proper conversion, a person's got a chance at having a proper temperature. And that is, the, that is the parameter that correlates best with the patient's system, symptoms is the temperature. And so we measure that during the day with an oral thermometer and when the temperature is supposed to be at its highest. This particular graph was uh, done in uh, 2014 in Italy and they, the black dots represent obese patients, the light dots represent lean controls, people who are normal weight. And even though this is about weight, uh, I think we could use this as a, a rough correlation between uh, metabolism, people with slow metabolism, people with normal metabolism. And you'll notice that the, the, the gray box there represents their temperatures during the nighttime. 
And during the nighttime, the temperature patterns for an obese patient or a normal patient are almost identical. In fact, the obese patient's temperatures are a little bit higher upon rising than that of the normal weight people. But notice during the day, three hours, three or four hours after a person wakes up over to the left-hand side of the curve, notice that's where a split uh, begins to occur between those who have a normal metabolism and those that have a slow metabolism. And it can easily be a degree difference. And this is in centigrade, but the, the difference here you're seeing is about a degree Fahrenheit. And that's what we typically see, and that's why we have patients measure their temperatures every three hours, starting three hours after they wake up, times three, to get some sample temperatures in this particular uh, range. And we've been uh, doing that for 20 years, and because that's when we, uh, that's the temperature range we find most predictable, or the temperature readings we find most predictable. And that's when people are having their symptoms the worst. And you can also take the temperature when you feel, a, when a patient is having their worst symptoms, and you can also take it when they are feeling their best. Uh, that way they can start making the correlation. So this um, represents what I just mentioned, and we take it with a, a gerotherm thermometer is a brand that we like, but it's available in any um, pharmacy or um, uh, department store. It's a liquid metal. It's uh, a, an alloy. It's not mercury, but it's like gallium, um, um, tin, and some other metal. Uh, and so those are, uh, it's an inexpensive way to uh, be able to tell a lot about how, how your patient's doing. So Let's talk about some of the things that, the T, if you just go by TSH, what you miss. These next slides I'm going to show you, you can see at the bottom, they're referenced in the, in the mainstream medical literature. And a lot of these, a lot of these uh, studies are talking about hypothyroidism that shows up on the, th the blood tests. They're talking about hypometabolism due to a supply problem. And I'm hoping at this point you'll be able to extrapolate these um, studies to the concept of, of low body temperatures due to a conversion problem. Whether it's due to a supply problem or a conversion problem, a low metabolism is going to cause the same symptoms. The symptoms of Wilson syndrome and the symptoms of hypothyroidism are identical. There is no way you do there's no way a person can have hypothyroid symptoms without having a low body temperature um, because that's what causes the symptoms. So here are some of the things that a low temperature can cause. It can cause mental dullness, forgetfulness, and they, this study showed that you have to rule out a metabolic problem before you can diagnose PMS. So think about that. Um, how many doctors, when they have a patient come in with PMS, automatically think, oh, let's, let's uh, see what their metabolism is like. Let's measure their temperature. Um, you know, most doctors were thinking of estrogen and progesterone and, and different things like that. But almost in this one study, 75% of the women with PMS had subclinical hypothyroidism. And even, even though they were just looking at the TSH, there was complete resolution in over 60% of them when they were treated with T4, and which you know uh, we just always talked already talked about, that's not that's not always going to be our favorite um, means because T4 can decrease T4 to T3 conversion. But even so, a whole bunch of people get better. Women get better when they're with their PMS when their temperatures normalize or when they're given thyroid treatment. So thyroid function should be checked in patients with panic disorder. And generalized anxiety disorder. You know, did you know that? I mean, I, I, I see this so common. It's so easy to fix that. It's uh, amazing once the temperature is normal. Hypothyroid often presents with obesity, low libido, sexual dysfunction, edema, fibromyalgia. There's some doctors that notice such a correlation between fibromyalgia symptoms and 
and low body temperature that some have come to the conclusion that it's pretty much the same syndrome. And um, it manifests, not everybody gets uh, the same symptoms, not everybody with low temperatures gets trigger points and muscle pain, but some people do, and other people might get hair loss or depression or panic attacks. Different people get different symptoms, but a low temperature can, can cause uh, headaches, migraines. We have people come in, get their temperature up, and their migraines go away. And that's the first time in 20 years they've been without a headache or without a migraine. Uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, a lot of people two weeks later can cancel their carpal tunnel syndrome surgery appointments because now the swelling is gone out of their hands and the impingement is gone and their, their numbness and tingling and, and um, problems go away. Same with irritable bowel syndrome. So think of that. When you th think of a person with irritable bowel syndrome, are you going to think low temperature? Are you going to think hypothyroidism? But I've seen, I've seen so many people with incredible irritable bowel syndrome that normalizes once their temperature is normal. So it can cause insomnia, hair loss, and get this, it can correct, T3 can correct up to 50% of treatment resistant depression. And you would be interested to know that about 66% or more of uh, about 66% of depression is treatment re resistant. So 50% of that would be 33%. So what it's saying is that T3 is at least as effective in depression as, as antidepressants are. And, and um, my feeling is that a lot of the people that do respond to antidepressants would also respond to T3. So I really think that T3 is a better treatment for depression than, than antidepressants are. And that antidepressants are the most widely prescribed medicine in the world, so or in, the, in this country at least. So, um, so yeah, a lot of people can, can benefit from normalizing the temperature. There's a little bit of... Uh, uh, Physiology, um, it's interesting that the TSH, when it stimulates the TSH receptor, it affects the sodium iodine symporter, regulating the amount of iodine it takes up. And that's how TSH works. It gets more iodine into the thyroid gland. Google is an herb that improves um, iodine transfer, transport through the NIS as well. And it also improves T4 to T3 conversion by the D2 or deiodinase enzyme. And uh, zinc and selenium are important cofactors. Selenium is right in the center of that D2 enzyme that converts T4 to T3. Notice in this diagram that the, that the D2 is outside the thyroid gland in the periphery of, uh, of the body. So much, the most of the, max, uh, the majority of the T4 in the body that's converted to T3 is converted peripherally. Um, this thing that you have a stressful lifestyle, with, um, excessive dieting, these are well known to impair T4 to T3 conversion and the stress, fasting, illness, um, cortisol, these are all known to impair T4 to T3 conversion. And notice this uh, Let's see, some of these, this particular diagram that you're looking at um, came from a study in 1977. Some, some of the references at the bottom are more recent than that. But think of that, 1977. We've known about the importance of T4 to T3 conversion since 1977. And, um, and yet uh, we don't really pay as much attention to it as we should. So some stri typical stressors that can lower body temperature or childbirth, divorce, death of a loved one, job or family stress, surgery or accidents, and even some people get their mercury, mercury amalgams removed out of their mouth and sometimes their temperature will go up just by doing that. Bromine, fluorine, and chlorine, these are halides that displace iodine and those 
can uh, decrease the function of the thyroid hormone of the thyroid gland. So again, childbirth is the number one cause, and it doesn't have to be the first pregnancy. It could be the third. Uh, but a woman will often say, "I was going along fine in my life until I had this pregnancy, and I've never been the same." So can the metabolism slow down and stay down? And uh, the answer is yes. Here's a study that shows that people can experience a sustained depression of the metabolic rate after a moderate, just a moderate or, or massive weight loss, even after refeeding. So the metabolism slows down to compensate for the starvation, and then when the starvation is over, their metabolic rate is persistently low. And that's the story you'll get from these people. They'll say, I was fine until I went through a, I lost my job five years ago. And then I got these symptoms. And, and then they got worse three years later when I got a divorce. They got worse. And then a year ago, my dog died. And they've gotten worse still. And it's just getting worse and worse, uh, worse and worse in stages. And that's a, a typical story of uh, their metabolic rate are going down and staying down. And uh, people with stories like that, their, their metabolic rate will often improve. Their symptoms will improve in stages as well with treatment. So <clears throat> this diagram, I don't have time to go into it very much, but the, the main point of this is this is what happens in the peripheral tissues of the body. This is a cell in the periphery. This it's not that this doesn't represent a, a follicular cell in the thyroid gland. This is this is any cell in the body. I like to say that I like to say that thyroid hormone is important only in those cells that contain DNA. If you have some cells that don't have DNA, then then they don't you don't have to worry about thyroid. And thyroid's not going to help them. But of course, every every cell has DNA, and every every cell is under regulation as to how much T4 is going to be converted to T3. It's under regulated. It could be affected by cold and beta adrenergic receptors. It could be affected by bile acids. That's why when people have low thyroid function, their cholesterol goes up. Um, it could be. And so certain circumstances will <clears throat> cause ubiquination of the D2 enzyme, which which targets that um, enzyme for destruction, or the ubiquination of the enzyme, which activates it so that it can convert T4 to T3. So the um, so the D2 enzyme responsible for conversion can can be downregulated or upregulated by the body. Uh, through these pathways according to the situation and circumstances the body's facing. So a great deal of the stimulation, of the T3 stimulation of the nucleus depends on the intracellular conversion of T4 to T3. That's regulated and that is invisible to thyroid hormone blood tests. Thyroid hormone blood tests measure the T4 and the T3 that's in the blood. It doesn't measure what's happening in the cell. So we talked a little bit about this. I won't go into it too much. <clears throat> it explains how the D2 enzyme is downregulated by, um, by these pathways. But the thing that is important is that T4 and reverse T3 can both accelerate the destruction of type 2 deiodinase. They can increase the downregulation of this. They can increase the destruction of of the D of the D2 enzyme to downregulate the enzyme, and so that can happen by as much as 50 percent. So this can explain why so many patients don't feel well on T4 containing medicine. So we're the patients already downregulating their enzyme, and then when we give them T4, uh, which is converted to reverse T3, especially if they're not converting it very well to T4. Then they'll have T4 and reverse T3, which greatly downregulates the conversion or downregulates the, the D2 enzyme, which results in decreased conversion of T4 to T3. So there are some people that will feel better on herbs that support thyroid hormone conversion 
than they will on T4. Because if a person has a conversion problem and they're treated with excess supply that further downregulates and impairs and suppresses their conversion, they could actually feel worse. But there are some people when you give them when you give them herbs that if they have a conversion problem and you give them herbs that support conversion, then they actually feel better. So so it's fascinating to think that some people will do better on herbs than they will on a thyroid hormone, which is completely uh, contrary, I think, to uh, you wouldn't expect that if you if you didn't accept the concept of conversion, you would have no way of explaining that. So with good T4 to T3 conversion, T4 medicine may improve a patient's temperature um, with um, and, and the thyroid hormone expression. With poor T4 to T3 conversion, it could conceivably make it worse. That this is explained. This explains why some people actually feel worse as the thyroid hormone medicine is increased. So when we're driving down the road <coughs> and we're wondering how fast we're going, we look at the speedometer, not the gas gauge. In the same way, a thermometer is literally a speedometer, and the body temperature is not a good measure of the metabolic rate it's an exact measure because by definition that's what that's what the metabolic rate is it's a it's a rate of your metabolism and your metabolism determines your body temperature so when you these this is just a graph of temperature mediated problems when your temperature is too low you can have a medical emergency you go into hypo, hypothermia, hypothermia hypothermia shock and when it's too high, you can have a medical emergency where you get heat stroke and you can die from that as well. And then you have a normal temperature. But there's, uh, if your temperature is a little bit high, like 100 degrees, you can get an excuse from a doctor to excuse you from school or work. But if your temperature is just as low, it's a degree and a half below normal, a lot of doctors will look at that and say, it's not a fever, you're fine. But that temperature range, I mean, we can see that this is a continuum, and we can see that uh, low temperature has, uh, we can expect a low temperature to cause symptoms of headache, fatigue, depression, and listlessness or other problems, just like um, a high temperature can. So lots of times in a lecture I'll ask, People, how many have they, How many people have seen temperatures normalized with herbs and nutrients? And a lot of them will say they have, and they'll, they'll uh, will describe some of the results they've seen, and how many people have seen uh, temperatures normalized with T3 alone. Um, we can't um, can't really do that in webinar format, but unless some of you want to type into uh, type into um, Jen. In your questions area, how many um, you know if you've if you've seen evidence of that? Maybe she can give us a report of how many of you out there have, have seen this kind of um, correlation between temperatures and uh, symptoms and herbs and nutrients and T3 and so on. Um, hypothyroidism we talked about uh, is uh, can be permanent or temporary. Wilson's temperature syndrome is often reversible. So when you when you go when you're looking at hypothyroidism, you you can um, determine what the cause of it is. Um, most likely, it will be Hashimoto's, and there is um, herbal and nutritional and hormonal treatment that that can be used um, to address uh, and lifestyle. Uh, things that can be used to to address Hashimoto's, um, and the um, and likewise with uh, Wilson's temperature syndrome, there's herbs and nutrients that can be used to promote T4 to T3 conversion, and also T3 therapy can be used to reset the thyroid hormone pathways and to uh, basically reboot them and clean them out, and reset them so that um, a person can start converting T4 to T3 on their own again. Um, 
I don't have enough time right now to go into these treatments, but we are going to be discussing that in uh, South Carolina at the conference. Um, I, we may be able to cover some of it in questions, but um, so but my main point in, in helping uh, in presenting today is I wanted you to uh, see and uh, know that TSH and body temperature are the combination, and, and I probably should change the, the order of that. I should say body temperature and TSH because you always want to look at the body temperature first. And then you look at the TSH to explain what's going on with the body temperature. The body temperature and TSH are the most predictive in helping patients feel well. If you don't consider body temperature and TSH, you have no promise. <laughs> you know, there's just going to be very little chance of you being able to uh, get people better predictably. Um, so for some reason, I'm thinking about a coin. Um, without, you know, it's like heads or tails. I mean, you know, if you don't have, um, if you don't have that guidance, you might as well flip a coin because you're not going to tell, you know, is it conversion? Is it supply? I have no idea. So I'm just going to guess. Um, so anyway, low body temperature can result from either inadequate supply centrally or inadequate conversion or expression peripherally. So a high TSH indicates a low thyroid hormone supply. And just as a caveat, if you have somebody come in with a, a, a high TSH, you may want to ask them if they're taking any iodine because if someone's taking 12 milligrams of iodine a day or more, then that itself can increase TSH. So you may think that you're looking at hypothyroidism when actually you're looking at um, upregulated um, TSH due to iodine consumption. So, um, but if they're not on any iodine and they have a high TSH, then you're going to be thinking about hypothyroidism. But if they have a normal TSH and low body temperature, that indicates intracellular peripheral problems. Uh, which are invisible with thyroid blood tests. And now I'd like to turn the time back over to Jen. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. That was excellent. I'm sure more than a few listeners had a little aha moment there. Moment there. So I'd like to take uh, some questions now. There's, there's a ton of them, and I apologize we won't be able to get to all of them, but there's some really good ones here. Uh, so, Dr. Wilson, are you ready for a Q&A? I am, but before we get there, I just want to mention one thing. People, um, the T3 exam, the benefit, one huge benefit for taking that exam is that there's always uh, patients that are looking for doctors that, that know about this concept, that treat this concept, that can help them with their problems. And so they're constantly looking on our websites, looking for practitioners. And one thing that will happen is as you pass the certification exam, that will that will allow you or qualify you to be listed on the website, so that patients looking for solutions can find practitioners that can provide them. Right, and that's very important. Um, you do become a member of AARM, and you'll be listed on our website. And there are a lot of people looking for help um, across the country. So, very important point. Um, so let's get into the questions. Uh, I have a patient who say. Uh, yes, my temperature always runs low, and then they say it's always been that way, and then they say when it's normal, I feel really warm and I don't feel well. So, you know, maybe this isn't a question you'll be able to thoroughly answer. It might be a little bit of a complex one, but is that a type of statement that could indicate this person is having a thyroid conversion problem, Dr. Wilson? Yes, I mean, that's a pretty typical thing. What, what you'll hear with people that have history of low body temperatures, they would say, they always say, I would have to be sick with a fever to have a normal temperature. And that's what they always say. That's, that's what we're looking at here. So uh, if a person, I mean, it sounds like the, in the scenario you just explained, uh, if a person with a normal temperature gets sick, they'll get a fever that will go above normal temperature. If their temperature is low and they get sick, then their temperature will go to, to normal. And so, I mean, just, uh, so I would say that them, them feeling bad in this case has more to them, has, has more to do with them having an illness than it does with them having a, um, 
having having uh, uh, you know I don't think the normal temperatures causing them to feel bad. I think it's the illness that's causing them to feel bad. Uh, that that's that would be typical um, if a person and you know and a lot of patients will tell you that okay I'm cold and I'm and I've got symptoms and then they'll then they'll um, go out into their car in the middle of the day because they have brain fog and they're in a 120 degree car for 15 minutes before they warm up like an alligator and can function again. So in the cases like that some people will tend to feel better but um, it's not typical that a normal temperature causes people to feel bad except so that would be extremely unusual and it would point towards them having a, an underlying um, infection or illness of some kind. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, here's another great question. Have you ever noticed a correlation between low thyroid and gallstones? There are some things that are more common than others and uh, certainly cholesterol is classic for um, high, high cholesterol is classic for low body temperatures because um, they used to use a high cord uh, it used to be before they had thyroid blood tests a, doc a patient would go into the doctor and the cholesterol would be high and the doctor would say oh you have hypothyroidism because your cholesterol is high that's the kind of correlation they made many many years ago um, as far as gallstones that is not uh, that is not one that comes up very commonly and um, there's some that come up very commonly and some that are a little bit more rare but um, I would say I would say I don't think I've heard of of one case that that I could definitively say you know sounded sounded like it was related the way the way you can tell if it's related is that or the, the, what I look for is that if you have a person who's symptoms come on with other symptoms and they tend to come on under stress and they come, tend to come on with low temperature and they tend to go away with a better temperature and that's, that's when you can tell that the symptoms are more likely related to a low body temperature and uh, but I can't, I can't think of a time where I've seen um, gallstones definitively connected with temperature. Right, so maybe the best thing is with that patient to go back and do the temperature check and see if there is some sort of problem and look at it from that point. Especially uh, that and also to um, look to see if they, I mean if they have gallstones like repeated gallstones and those gallstones started occurring when they weren't under some stress and at the same time they got 16 other symptoms of hypothyroidism then maybe then maybe there may be a correlation so you look at other symptoms and you look at when they came on and you look at temperature but if you, you know it's hard to it's hard to do that with gallstones because they come on so infrequently usually right right um, oh here's a good question you spoke about edema in women um, can we you also use that same parameter in men uh, who have edema and then do look for the uh, temperature for them as well Certainly, certainly uh, fluid retention, you know, uh, low body temperature can cause fluid retention in men certainly along with other, uh, it's not the only explanation but it, it, is, a, it is one possible explanation for sure. Okay, and somebody asked um, what kind of T3 are you using? We like to use sustain release T3 compounded by compounding pharmacists, uh, that's our preference. Uh, it, Sometimes cytomel can be used, and um, cytomel can be used, and it can be well tolerated by many people. But some people don't tolerate cytomel very well because uh, it can co contribute to unsteady T3 levels. And sustained release T3 can be better tolerated in many people for that reason. Right. Um, and then some people have asked about replaying this webinar and it will be available on our YouTube station so just go to YouTube and type in restorative medicine and uh, you can watch that yourself or share that with your friends. Um, some other questions here. Um, this is a good one maybe more about conversion. Although T3 is found intracellularly, what about free T3? Uh, since we can measure that, um, is that, what's the difference and what would be the benefit? I I would say the 
there wouldn't really be a benefit in measuring that too much. I mean, myself, I mean, different doctors will have different uh, opinions, and you can make some sense out of it, but all I'm saying, all I will say about that is that you can have a low free T3, or let's say you can even have a free, you can have a high free T3. You could have a high free T3 in a patient that has a low body temperature and has a normal TSH, and they still have a problem. So even right. though the even though the blood test would look like they don't have a conversion problem, they still can. So you don't. I don't like to exclude patients based on a T3. It's always nice to have a low free T3 to justify your treatment. But the only problem with justifying your treatments according to blood tests like that is that means you're also inclined or obligated maybe to to exclude patients based on uh, normal tests. And um, and I've seen from experience that people can have um, they can have a low TSH, they could have a low reverse T3, a, a high free T3 or a high T3, and they could still have a low temperature and they could still feel bad and they could still respond to treatment. So um, so that's why um, it's not predictive. It doesn't correlate with the uh, person's symptoms the way temperature does. Yeah, and I know you get into that a lot more in detail um, when you do your full talk because um, the measuring the serum levels of T3 isn't the same as knowing what's going on in the tissues and the peripheral tissues, and so and that causes the symptoms. So, um, like you said, that lab test isn't really that useful in this kind of situation. Exactly. Um, so there are so many questions. Can you spend a few more minutes with us, Dr. Wilson? Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, people are asking about the herbs and which ones might help with the conversion specifically. Uh, do you want to just kind of give a brief little overview on that? Well, sure. There's um, there, the herbs. Google myrrh is uh, excellent for con uh, the conversion of T4 to T3. And that's G-U-G-G-U-L, uh, not Google, as in the search term. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then um, then you have um, blue flag iris is uh, really good for the thyroid gland. It used to be used as a drug in the early 1900s before pharmaceutical came, before pharmaceutical companies came along. Um, it was used to treat hypothyroidism. It's uh, good at um, it's good at um, detoxifying. We believe the thyroid gland. There's um, uh, let's see. I just mentioned blue flag iris, right? And then yeah. there's and that one's really. Um, that one's hard to find, but Restorative uh, Formulations carries that. I don't think I've seen any other companies that carry blue flag iris like that. Um, it, it's a very specialized herb for that purpose. Yes. And, the, um, and of course, uh, fucus uh, or bladder rack, mm -hmm. uh, we use those to provide substrates to the thyroid gland and the thyroid function. We use um, selenium is very important to T3, T4 to T3 conversion. Uh, zinc, um, iodine. So there's a lot of things that you could do to to support that. I the it's important. You know, there's a lot of power in herbs. Of course, they it depends on how well they are um, combined. You want to have a good formula by design, and how well the plants are grown and how well they're harvested and processed and concentrated. And so uh, don't believe that all herbs are created equal, or her herbal products maybe I should say. So you definitely right. want to, and, and the other thing too, another big secret when it comes to herbs and thyroid is if you're not, if you need to be able to dose those herbs according to body temperature. If you're using a product that doesn't change the body temperature, then, then you're using a product that's not that's not uh, improving this improving the system. So it, whatever whatever products that you use, uh, you ought to be able to see a difference in the temperature. And if you don't, then 
you have no promise, no, no guarantee that you're getting anywhere at all. No reason to expect a patient will feel better. That's such a good tip because there's such a variety of herb quality out there and now, now people have, doctors have a way to really determine if it's a good quality herb because they can measure temperature so easily. So that's such a, um, a huge tip that you're offering people. Um, someone's asking, we have so many questions, I just want to ask, answer a couple more. Someone's asking about special directions you give to the pharmacist about compounding. Um, I think it'd be fine to mention uh, the pharmacy that you recommend because they're very familiar with this, um, or if you have any tips about that. Yeah, you can contact Medaus Pharmacy. It's M-E-D-A-U-S dot com, M-E-D-A-U-S dot com, and uh, they uh, can answer your questions about that. They've been doing it for nearly 20 years, I guess. Yeah, that's. A, I mean, they know what they're doing, and you won't have to explain it to them. Um, is T3 safe to use in a Graves' disease patient? Graves' disease patient who had low temperatures. Yes, yes, it is, and that's a really interesting question. That's a kind of question that a lot of people wouldn't even think is possible. But yes, it is possible to have a low temperature in a Graves' patient and which does su suggest a conversion problem and yes they they could respond to, to, to T3 therapy. In addition to that I'll just quickly mention that um, I know of one case where where a person not only did, were they treated were the Graves patients treated with T3 to to correct their temperature and help them feel better but uh, one doctor that I know actually used for some reason, she thought T3 would be a good treatment for Graves itself. And uh, her thinking was that maybe if she gave T3, it would put the thyroid gland at rest. And sure enough, she, she gave a, this Graves patient T3 therapy, and the patient's uh, TSH, the patient's Graves disease resolved. Wow, that's great. Um, you know, there's just so many questions here. I don't think we can get to them all, but I, I mean, there are a lot of very detailed questions. So I really recommend for those people to, um, at a minimum, read the book, but I would definitely recommend coming to the conference and listening to Dr. Wilson and Dr. Holtorf because they will cover all of these topics and by going in depth. And it, it is something that you want to hear all the material before you go and test it on your patients because they do give very practical tips and hints on uh, how to do it, uh, what to look out for clinically, and how to prescribe, et cetera. Um, and there are some naturopaths here who are asking about um, the fact that they can't prescribe the T3. And uh, like Dr. Wilson said, sometimes you can get good results with herbs. Um, but again, it's about getting good quality herbs and getting the right herbs. And uh, he does cover that in the conference as well. Um, and he talks about nutrients and food, which are some of the questions here. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. I know that was very enlightening for everybody. We had an amazing turnout. And please do feel free to share the uh, YouTube link with your friends and family. It's a fun conference. It's a very friendly conference. And uh, we really get great uh, feedback on it afterwards because of Dr. Wilson and all the other topics that we do cover. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And hope you have a wonderful day. And thank you again, Dr. Wilson. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. And I'll, I'll just add that the, the herbs and nutrients you're mentioning um, often do help in, in uh, getting people's temperatures to normal. In fact, um, so they can often get their temperature to normal 70% of the time uh, just with herbs and nutrients in a conversion problem. Yeah, that's really great to know. Um, so always good to do that and, and the T3 together. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Hope to see you soon.